This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Welcome back to this very special bonus episode of Beyond the Big Screen. Today we aren't specifically talking about a movie, but instead we're revisiting a topic we discussed in a previous episode, figure skating through the movie Hello London. The 23rd Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea are upon us, and I am very happy to be joined by Ryan Stevens of the Skate Guard blog to give us a little primer on Olympic figure skating. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ryan. Oh, you're most welcome. It's a pleasure to speak with you again. Ryan Stevens is a former competitive figure skater and CFSA Skate Canada judge. He's been writing about figure skating history since 2013. Ryan has media credentials with Skate Canada covering the 2016 Canadian Tire National Skating Championships in Halifax, as well as conducting interviews with many of the top figure skaters, past and present. And in June 2017, Ryan released a full-length biography of British actress, figure skater, and dancer Belita Jepson Turner, who is a contemporary of Sonia Henney, who we discussed in the Hello London episode, which will be linked to in this, in the show notes for this episode, as well as the links to Skate Guard. So I highly suggest you go back and listen to that episode because it was a lot of fun and very informative. Before we get rolling, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your blog? Absolutely. So I'm based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, up here in Canada, um, for those of you that are down in the States. And uh, I write about skating history all around the world, and I kind of bounce a little bit. I bounce around a little bit. I release three blogs a week covering a whole range of topics, everything from um, how skating might have developed in a certain country to a biography of a skater to a look back at at an event past. So we just kind of bump bump around a little bit, and uh, it's really a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds like it, and it, it gives you a lot of avenues to discover and explore different areas of the sport. Absolutely. Now, can you just give us maybe a little bit of history or context to figure skating as an Olympic uh, sport? Certainly. So the first time that figure skating was actually included in the Olympic Games was in 1908. It was included in the Summer Olympic Games in London, England, and uh, it there were three categories, uh, pardon me, four categories. Uh, there were men's and women's single skating, pair skating, and a category that was only ever held at that first Olympics called special figures, where skaters would trace out uh, very intricate designs on the ice uh, that they created themselves. And that was only held at the 1908 Olympics. Uh, the figure skating was included in the 1920 Summer Summer Olympics as well, and it was first included in the Winter Olympics in 1924. And it's been probably the most popular, if not um, one of the most popular, but I like to think the most popular uh, sport in the Winter Olympics um, since then. Uh, And at Winter Olympics uh, in 2014 in Sochi, Russia, a new event uh, was added to uh, the uh, lineup of figure skating events, and that was the team event. And uh, that's going to be contested again in Korea, and it's a really interesting uh, and unique format that I think will bring um, a lot of excitement to the to the roster of competitions that everybody will be seeing. You've shown us how the events, some of the events have changed. There's some events that are no longer a part of Olympic figure skating, and then there's some events that have been added. As a part of maybe the strategy of the game or how it's judged, how has that evolved over the course of the uh, years since the Olympics have started? Well... How has judging changed? Well, um, maybe how more so how 
I guess it plays into judging. How has it changed from maybe more of a, um, like technically, maybe how has it changed? Well, technically it's changed in a lot of ways. Um, If you look at, so right now, uh, if you don't count this new team event and you take into account single skating, pair skating, and ice dancing, which was added to the Olympics uh, in 1976 for the first time. Those are the, those are the four uh, main disciplines, men's and women's singles, pairs, and ice dance. And all four of those disciplines have uh, changed from, they changed their formats from when they first started in the game. So in single skating, uh, you used to see school figures where, where uh, skaters would skate out, would trace out uh, set patterns on the ice, and then free skating. Pairs skating started with just a free skate, and ice dancing started with compulsory dances. Now you won't find school figures at all uh, in, so there's no figures in figure skating, um, in single skating. Pair skating has had a short program at it, and the compulsory dances are gone from ice dance. And now you'll see a short dance and a free dance. So all four of the disciplines have changed their formats since they were first introduced to the games. And what you'll see are a, uh, a short program and a free skate in the singles and the pairs, and then the short dance and the free dance and ice dance now. So <laughs> that might be, might be a little confusing if you've never seen skating before uh, in the games, but basically in every discipline you're going to see all of the skaters twice. They're going to come out once and perform a short program or a short dance, and they're going to come out a second time and perform a free skate or a free dance. That's what I love. That's something like it's called figure skating, but the actual event that it, the name is based on isn't even a part of the event anymore. It is not. And I think it's, I mean, I, I think skating has evolved uh, to such a technical level now that um, it should almost be called, um, I don't know, ice jumping or something, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, no, fi- there are no more figures in figure skating, at least at the Olympics. <laughs> now, as you as a professional and aficionado and somebody who's really into skating and figure skating, what are some of the high points you think um, that you've seen in previous Olympics? Oh, my goodness. It, they're, they're too numerous to even mention. I mean, one of one of my favorite Olympic memories uh, was from the 1988 Olympic Games uh, in Calgary, Alberta, when Elizabeth Manley, uh, she wasn't even expected to be one of the challengers for the top two spots at all, and she'd gone through so much in the years uh, leading up to the Olympic Games, um, and it was supposed to be a showdown between... Uh, an American skater, Debbie Thomas, and uh, an East German skater, Katarina Vett. And it was called the Battle of the Carmens because both skaters were skating to music from Bizet's Carmen. And Elizabeth Manley came out of nowhere, had the free skate of her life, uh, earned a standing ovation, brought the house down, and she won the... She didn't win the gold medal, but she won the free skate. And... uh, that that moment stands um, out in my mind as being one of the biggest, uh, I don't know, biggest Olympic moments that I've ever seen. And another would definitely be um, Jane Torbo and Christopher Dean's uh, winning free dance from the 1984 Sarajevo Olympics. They skated to Ravel's Bolero, and uh, that program still is considered um, one of, if not the best free dance of all time. Now, it always begs the question, if you have some highlights, what do you think are some of maybe the lowlights or things that just did not go very well or maybe something with judging, some of the parts that maybe didn't speak as well? Well, I can certainly talk about some of the well-known controversies 
over the years, um, and figure skating is no stranger to, to controversies at the Olympics. Um, the 1936 Winter Olympic Games in Garmisch Partenkirchen, uh, Germany, uh, they were held right before, I mean, we're talking less than four years before World War II broke out in Nazi Germany. And one of the British skaters uh, at those games, his name was Freddie Tomlins. He had the, had the nerve, I guess you would say, to walk right up to Hitler himself and ask for an autograph. He was thrown out in the snow, skates and all, and uh, was locked out there in the freezing cold until they decided to let him back in. And needless to say, the British skaters were not treated well at those games. And the uh, and that actually was uh, interesting in that Cecilia College, who was a British skater, she was competing against Sonia Henney, and she lost to her at those games, and many felt that she had outskated her. Um, and in more recent years, uh, I think probably the two most famous figure skating controversies or, or low life at the Olympics were the whole uh, Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan scandal at the 1994 Games in Lillehammer, Norway, and the 2002 uh, judging scandal uh, where judging corruption was revealed at the Olympic Games in Salt Lake City. And as a result of, of that scandal, Two pairs um, in the pairs competition ended up uh, both receiving gold medals, and uh, there were major changes to uh, the International Skating Union's uh, system of judging, and as a result, a whole new uh, a whole new way of judging figure skating came to be, and that is the judging system that you'll be seeing at uh, at the games in Korea. The judging system is very complicated, and it's really not designed for laymen to really understand even what would you say if you're a person sitting in the sitting at home watching this what would you look for in the judging to have maybe a little bit better understanding of what's going on well you're absolutely right that it's not designed for the layman and i think that's the unfortunate part of it all um but a few things to keep in mind would be that uh, just because a skater lands every jump in their program or interprets the music beautifully, or creates a moment, that doesn't mean they're going to win. Uh, every single element that you're going to see is dissected, and it's scored for its difficulty and the grade of, ex- and the grade of execution. So that is to say the quality of the element. So a skater who performs four triple jumps can easily lose to a skater who tries four quadruple jumps and uh, messes up three of them because the program with the four quads uh, is more difficult than the program with the four triples. So in singles and pair skating, you're looking to see how difficult the programs are and how cleanly they, they land their jumps. And in the ice dance competition, which doesn't include jumps, the kind of things you're going to be looking out for most would be uh, the speed of the skaters, the, the depth and the quality of their edges in the ice, uh, their control and their unison. So what you're saying is that this really is, it's the athleticism is the thing that's being judged and not necessarily the entertainment value, the, like you said, the emotional value. Absolutely. So you might, you might see something that's amazing. You know, a skater might land every single jump and, and you might watch it and go, wow, that was amazing. They, they're definitely going to win. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to win because they might have, uh, if their program um, wasn't as difficult as somebody else's who made mistakes, or if they, uh, or if their landings to their jumps uh, weren't as clean as they should be, all those little things are going to be uh, picked apart using slow motion replay, um, using a, a technical panel of experts who are who are there to look at every single element and decide how it should be rewarded or marked down. So every little thing that a skater does is being um, picked apart to, to the, uh, to, down to every single detail. So you kind of, um, 
you kind of have to enjoy it for what it is, but accept that just because something looked amazing doesn't mean that it was in the eyes of the judges. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. So would you say that skaters who try to do something more difficult and are more on the edge on that aspect are probably, it's rewarded to be more on the edge? Uh, so, yes, yeah, skaters who are who are attempting more difficulty in their program are generally going to have, uh, they have higher base values uh, for their elements and they're going to be rewarded more. Another thing that, that skaters are rewarded for currently, and this may be something that changes in the future, but it, it, it's the way that it is now, is that um, if you see a skater and they're doing a lot of their jumps in the second half of their program, they're going to have um, an advantage over skaters that are, that are doing um, more jumps in the first half. There's a bonus uh, for skaters who attempt more jumps in the second half of the program, so that's something to watch for, too. Do you think that they're missing out on something by not considering artistry? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, before this judging system was brought into play, um, skaters received marks for uh, for technical merit and artistic impression or um, required elements in presentation. And those two marks were weighed equally. Um, well generally weighed equally, weighed equally, but now skaters will receive uh, a technical score, and then they'll receive a score for something called program components. And there's six parts, um, six different things that they look for in program components. So if you see a technical score and you see a program component score, you would assume, based on watching skating, someone who's watched skating casually, uh, under the old system, that program components would be the equivalent of, of a presentation or an, or an artistic impression score, but that's not really the case. Um, at least half of the criteria that they look at for the second mark are actually um, things that relate to the technical side of skating um, that look at uh, just the quality of their skating skills, things like that. So very realistically only about uh two of the of the criteria of program components really reward artistry so it really is about the jumps or about the technical elements now and less about the performance but i think i think in time you'll see some changes made that will kind of get things a little bit um more back to reality or more balanced i guess i would say for somebody sitting on their couch at home and they're not really that familiar with the scoring system, like after they watch a a performance, what's a good score? Well, that's the thing. I mean, it all you, you're going to see it'll you'll see um, scores that would be um, a skater's season's best or or personal best. They're not so much competing for a certain number as they are trying to beat their own scores. And I honestly think rather than try to go, well, this is a good score that you need to achieve, you're better off writing down the scores of, uh, keep a note of the scores of the skaters that you like and and compare them to the scores of, of each skater as they come up. Because there's not really a, you know, there's not really a, uh, this is the score you have to achieve to win. Oh, so it's not, you better get X to get the gold. It's more, it's a comparison at the moment. Well, it, it's what the judges decide to give you for the elements that you perform. So there, there is no, you have to have X to get gold. The last thing I would really say is that figure skating is such a fun, watchable sport. And even if you don't need to know everything about it, if you don't, um, then I would definitely... <laughs> The person to be following, uh, really, is um, Jackie Wong, who runs the uh, Rocker Skating um, site. Is, uh, you can find him on Twitter. It's at Rocker Skating. He is the person to follow. He does play-by-plays and everything. He knows the, the technical side of skating inside, out, and backwards. 
and uh, if you really want to to know what you're watching, then you need you need to subscribe. I definitely would. Can you just share a little bit more about your blog and how we can reach it? Sure. So you can find uh, the blog on um, on Blogspot at Skateguard One at blogs dot blogspot dot ca. Uh, we're on Facebook at Skateguard, uh, Twitter at Skateguard Blog, and Pinterest at Skateguard. And uh, it's a lot of fun. We look at all different aspects of skating history, uh, everything from uh, we. I look. I've looked at the the culinary history of skating. Um, I looked at uh, the history of spinning, um, and uh, even a even a Barnum and Bailey uh, circus daredevil t- uh, turned uh, figure skating in the 1910s. So all kinds of really 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 quirky, interesting stories that uh, you don't have to be a, a figure skating aficionado to to appreciate. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on, Ryan. I think I know a lot more about what to look forward to in figure skating. And I think that uh, the listener will too. Oh, I hope so. I hope they, I hope they tune in and enjoy all the wonderful skating in Korea. It's going to be a fabulous time. Of course, you can also find more about Ryan's blog in the show notes. I encourage you, if you have questions, comments, or feedback, to email me at steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time beyond the big screen.